In this episode, we discuss embedded vision for the industrial Internet of Things. My guest on this episode is Taylor Cooper. Taylor is the CEO and Principal Engineer at Misty West, an engineering product development consultancy that acts as the bridge from concept to assembly line for intelligent and connected devices with deep expertise in optics, embedded vision, AWS and Azure IoT, low power electronics and wireless connectivity. And they've recently developed a system on module solution that is capable of performing AI computer vision tasks at 50% lesser power than other processors on the market. A quick thank you to our sponsors. This episode is made possible by our friends at Hive MQ, who are providers of an enterprise grade edge and cloud based MQTT broker. So please do check them out to help support this podcast. Welcome to the fourth generation podcast here on industry 4 which is a series of weekly interviews designed to help you learn industrial IoT from some of the world's leading practitioners. So if you're new here, please make sure to subscribe and click on the notification bell so that you never miss any of the interviews. If you find this conversation interesting, please review it with 5,000 on Apple Podcasts, follow on Spotify, and you can also connect with me on LinkedIn at Kudzai Mandi Teresa. So Taylor, uh, I would like to welcome you to the show. Thank you so much for taking the time to join us uh, today. Yeah, thank you so much for having me here today, Kudzai. Awesome. Yeah, so it's actually great to to talk to you again. Uh, I think the last time we spoke, uh, it was um, late last year or beginning of this year. And uh, that time you're actually taking up a role as a CEO of your uh, company, Mr. West. Uh, so can you uh, tell us a bit about uh, Mr. West? What is it all about? Yeah, um, it's a really great place to work, I'd say. Uh, we work on a lot of interesting technology. Um, you know, we're an engineering consultancy, so we do product development really in the industrial and commercial spaces for IoT devices. Um, so we work on everything from um, like medical imaging sensors, so like custom spectroscopic cameras to uh, muon tomography solutions for mining, um, to uh, like uh, low power, low cost wearables um, for activity monitoring and things like that. Um, just a lot of different tech. Um, yeah. Okay. Yeah. So I think you 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 work in a very interesting field with the, with an opportunity to actually come across uh, a lot of uh, different technologies be before they become mainstream. Could you talk to us about some trends that you are actually seeing? as far as IoT is concerned? Yeah, it's uh, there's a lot going on in the space. Um, I mean, there's the obvious ones, I think, which are, um, you know, a lot of the core technology that, one of the biggest recent trends um, is just the chip shortage, um, which has been impacting a lot of our clients and has actually caused us to start developing some of our own IP, which I'll talk more about in a bit. Um, but there are other trends we're seeing too right now. Um, in terms of uh, the space itself. I IoT is a pretty fragmented area. There's a lot of people trying to solve um, you know, similar problems. Um, so you've got um, a lot of people who are working on like low code IoT frameworks for integrating IoT solutions and things like that. Um, and then you've got, so companies like Belena, uh, Lorsant would be one. Um, And then you've also got, you know, there's a whole bunch of companies like that. And then you've got, um, you know, your larger uh, IoT frameworks like uh, Azure IoT and AWS IoT. Um, and if you look at uh, Google's IoT offering, um, it sounds like they're actually ending support for that pretty soon. So that, you know, that's another big trend. Um, yeah. Oh yeah, that's uh, quite interesting. I mean, I would like to get your thoughts on uh, uh, Google uh, ending its, its IoT core uh, offering, what what would you attribute that to? Do you think the, there isn't demand for IoT services or is there any other reason? Yeah, it's hard to say. I think there's been, um, IoT has kind of a boom and bust cycle going on and we might be seeing it again right now is what I would say. Um, you know, I, I some of these companies I just mentioned, like they're actually trimming headcount right now. Um, so I think, you know, 
there's a bit of a struggle to see who's going to win this. And there's been a lot of pressure. C-suite come at, at larger companies are aware of IoT now. So there's a lot of marketing material getting thrown at them. And IoT projects are going from things that were like uh, on the side of an engineer's desk as a Raspberry Pi where one person is just working on it to, you know, the management of a company is looking at how can we use this to scale our business and things like that. So it's becoming more mainstream, but I think um, there's also in increased competition. So companies like um, uh, Particle, uh, Particle IO, you might know them, they, yes. they are growing and they seem to be picking up market share. Um, but some of these other companies um, like Larsen, Belena, are, are struggling. Um, so I guess GCP might be going um, with their IoT offering, they might be going this, that same direction, whereas um, AWS and Azure are um, turning out to be uh, major players in the space, I guess, and starting to um, really consolidate their hold. I mean, most of the projects we do are on Azure or AWS. Um, Azure tends to be more common in really the mining sector and, and things like that. Um, so a lot of like utilities companies that typically had a lot of like um, interaction with Microsoft um, really before cloud computing tended to just stick with Microsoft. So like government entities as well. Um, whereas AWS tends to be uh, maybe more associated with uh, newer players, newer entrants to the market. Um, and they both have their advantages, their pros and cons. Interesting. Yeah, because even uh, to your point, Azure, Azure, Microsoft, in fact, has been uh, in the industrial space for like since the, the early 90s when the, actually, when, when the uh, PC actually uh, started to infiltrate the, 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 the manufacturing space. And a lot of uh, manufacturing companies have, have actually just remained with Microsoft for, 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 for their cloud offering uh, uh, via Azure services. So that's quite uh, interesting that you mentioned that. And uh, also another interesting fact that you mentioned is that we see some other companies growing and some other companies actually downsizing. And uh, uh, actually, I, I recently joined a, a company uh, called Hive MQ, uh, which is... Uh, uh, provides uh, MQTT uh, a broker, right? And we've actually seen a, a lot of adoption of MQTT, uh, particularly in the manufacturing space. So it's quite interesting to see that kind of uh, uh, dynamic going on. So I'm, I'm curious to, to, to find out uh, in, in your area, have you seen a lot of MQTT? Yeah, um, absolutely. And it's something that... Um... You know, we do a lot of work in computer vision um, and you wouldn't think MQTT is related to computer vision. Um, but, you know, as intelligence moves to the edge, it's something we're monitoring. We also see, you know, MQTT used in all, all the regular spaces you would expect. And another thing um, that I've seen are several security companies uh, that are basically selling uh, frameworks to kind of basically have like... Uh, a secure access to devices that may be behind complicated network architectures. And they're kind of looking at like an MQTT based pub sub networking solution. So they're not actually quite using MQTT, but they're really using a lot of kind of similar technology. Um, there's actually a few of them. Um, one of them is operant networks. Um, and another one is uh, the at sign foundation. Um, they're both quite interesting, but um, maybe, there's another one I could mention too, but I think they've gone out of business, so it's probably not worth mentioning. <laughs> um, but um, for 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 AtSign, um, you might want to check them out. They have a GitHub; it's a free service. Um, but basically, they um, add basically a secure key to a SIM card, which you can install in your device, um, and then you put a little piece of software on your device, and it will call up to a cloud server. Um, and authenticate itself. And then it'll initiate uh, like a web socket or a tunnel between that device and the web server, which allows you to get access to your device without having to hop through, um, you know, uh, a VPN or getting access in like a, so like if you're installing devices at a utility or something like that, it can be really complicated to get through all the layers of network security to get access to something like this. But if they're willing to connect your device to the internet in some way, um, this can be a secure way to do it. And then they're kind of operating in like something very similar to MQTT or they're usually sending something similar to an MQTT message. Um, on the computer vision side, um, you know, one of the, a lot of our clients are doing low power computer vision and, and um, 
you know, they might be battery powered. So streaming video up to the, the cloud um, is a challenge, I think. Um, and in those kinds of applications, moving intelligence to the edge is um, a big game changer. Um, and we've worked on a few projects where that intelligence at the edge has really allowed, um, you know, lower bandwidth uh, IoT communication protocols like MQTT. So like you can imagine if you're doing um, people tracking or something like that, um, you know, in, an, in a meeting room, um, if you can move the intelligence to the edge there, then you could potentially um, have a battery power device. Like this, um, uh, Eda Compute is the name of the company. Um, so they're making, uh, they're making custom, like a neural processing unit. Um, this is where you um, basically design silicon for running a specific type of neural network. So they're trying to basically run a low resolution, like VGA resolution camera. Um, and they want to do, say, an object recognition algorithm running on that on like milliamps of power. Um, and then they've they've built a solution for basically doing people counting inside an office that is battery powered and can run for something like three years on a battery and communicates over Bluetooth. Um, um, so basically, you just get a number of people in that room. So you can imagine that changes how uh, you could do people counting in a big way, as opposed to having to like run a cable, run an Ethernet uh, connection, or make sure that you have a Wi-Fi network there all the time. Um, you can just have a thing that you stick on. And, and I think those are the kinds of trends that, um, you know, as the compute gets more powerful and more efficient and battery performance continues to trend up, uh, you know, seeing battery powered computer vision applications, um, uh, it's going to become more common and you're going to start to see technology change um, quite a bit in that area. Okay, so uh, earlier on, you mentioned that your your company is actually uh, 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 developing uh, some solutions to, 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 to alleviate the chip shortage. Could you uh, uh, tell us a bit more about that? Yeah, so, you know, as I was mentioning, we do a decent amount of work in computer vision and a lot of the companies we work with are currently or were, you know, right towards the end of the pandemic, procuring solutions um, from Broadcom, so like a Raspberry Pi compute module, or from NXP, like an IMX6 or an IMX8, um, or often solutions from NVIDIA as well, like a TX2. Um, and right around uh, a year ago, um, all of their lead time started increasing. Um, and many of the customers we had who were working with, say, the Raspberry Pi compute module just had their orders canceled completely. Um, and right around December last year, which is when we last talked, we were exploring what we could do to help them. Um, and we realized that um, there's one manufacturer who is kind of on the cutting edge with some of this technology and is also not nearly as impacted um, by the chip shortage. And that's Renesas. Um, and uh, that, that would be like Hitachi's uh, semiconductor manufacturing group effectively. Um, and they actually have multifab. So they have, work with Samsung um, to get their parts made. And they also have fabs in Japan. And I think they also work with like TSMC. So, you know, when the CM4 was going um, basically end of life and we're not going to fulfill your orders because Broadcom was shifting production to um, sell parts into the automotive sector, um, Renesas was having similar parts that were really sticking around a 26 week lead time. Um, so at that point we, we reached out to them and a few other partners and basically said, hey, maybe we should try to build a solution in this space. So we ordered a thousand sets of parts um, so that we'd have something on hand because we didn't know how bad it was gonna get. And we started designing a SOM around the Renesas uh, RZ-V2L, um, which is, uh, it's kind of like a Raspberry Pi, but it has a dedicated neural processing unit. Um, so it has similar performance to say an NVIDIA Jetson Nano, but at half the power consumption and um, lower cost. Um, so we're developing a SOM around that. And it's also pink compatible with um, the RZ G2L, which is a more general purpose uh, processing unit, which is cheaper that doesn't have the MPU for computer vision. Um, so it might be more suitable for like an IoT gateway, or you know, if you wanted to build an IoT device with a display um, that needs to be Wi-Fi connected, um, it's pretty simple. Um, you know, it's good for applications like that. Um, so we're just uh, we entered into a partnership with Renesas on developing these, um, and we're just ordering alpha units now. We're hoping to have them in hand uh, in 
uh, October. Um, so, uh, you know, if you have any interest, um, you can reach out to, to me at Misty West. Um, we also have a group gets campaign. You can search for Misty Som, M-I-S-T-Y, S-O-M, all one word. Um, you'll find it, it's pretty unique. Um, so you can also add comments and questions there if you have any, any interest. Um, yeah, so basically it's a, it's a great solution and I can talk a bit about applications too, um, but it's a great solution if you're looking at a battery powered computer vision that's you know not super high compute. So like if you need an NVIDIA Xavier or, or Ryan um, or Oren, um, then uh, you know it's not gonna be comparable with those solutions. Um, but if you're around the Jetson Nano and you wanna possibly explore doing something on the low power side or low cost side, um, it could be a great solution for you. Oh, okay. Yeah, maybe let's move to the uh, application. Let's talk about the applications. What are the potential applications for, for this solution? Yeah, so there's two, there's a bunch of applications, I would say. Um, so like some of our existing clients um, are, are building things like um, smart toilets and they, you know, they want to measure, say, Bristol stool scale at a long-term care facility. Um, and they'd like to do that with a battery powered computer vision solution. So, you know, that's one thing. Um, so there's some like health related um, elements there. There's also um, sports related applications. Um, so one of the projects we're working on um, is related to measuring, um, you know, your golf swing and providing feedback on that. Um, so you can imagine a bunch of cameras around a golf course. They don't necessarily have power, um, but it'd be great if, if, you know, you could uh, record a swing and save that locally and then upload it later to provide feedback and things like that. Um, <clears throat> one of the uh, topics we're exploring in depth right now um, is for a smart cities application with a local company called Novax Industries. So they're one of the leaders in North America for basically um, uh, providing uh, pedestrian safety equipment for intersections. So like um, the walk signs or the buttons you push to turn on the walk sign or or like a small speaker that lets you know you can walk, those kinds of things. Um, they provide solutions in that space and they also supplied some of the supporting hardware. Um, so for like the on-site traffic control, um, as well as uh, um, like power supplies that need to be designed custom to support the, the hand sign or the signal indicators. Um, so we're exploring the opportunity with them right now to um, basically build a pedestrian tracking solution. So you could tell, you know, is someone in the intersection, do we need to extend the walk sign? Um, you know, uh, is somebody crossing the street without activating the signal? Should we activate the signal or in some way warn, warn traffic? Um, could we connect uh, the speaker to this system and say, hey, there's somebody in the waiting area, like communicate to them when the, when the walk sign goes active. There's a, there's a bunch of kind of safety implications there. Um, and there's also some some power constraints and there are other issues. Like if you look at the current systems, um, a lot of them are kind of in the vein of what I was describing earlier. So um, I think Bosch has a solution in the space um, and they, they charge something like $1,000 a year per camera um, and then like $4,000 to install the camera. And that's because, you know, they're making you basically connect to their uh, to their servers and send uh, basically like an H.264 encoded video stream um, up to the server, um, which, you know, there's some advantages to having continuous recording of an intersection. Um, but if you wanted to say, cover all the angles in an intersection, you might need three or four cameras and that's getting pretty expensive for most cities. Um, you know, it might be better if you could get to a lower power situation where you're running some of the compute on the edge. Maybe you decide to send the video stream up sometimes, but maybe you decide to run some intelligence at the edge and say, you know, how many people are crossing or is there someone in the intersection? Run that um, kind of object detection or image segmentation algorithm in an MPU or, or something like that um, at the edge and then send, uh, you know, text-based information. Um, where it needs to go. <clears throat> so that's the solution we're working on with them. Um, and then the other application to mention um, is in the commercial fishing space. Um, so another another local company we're talking to, they um, build monitoring equipment for large commercial fishing vessels. You can imagine it's a camera system that's basically deployed filming the back of the boat. So when they start fishing, you know if there's things like bycatch. So if they're accidentally catching, you know, a shark when they're supposed to be fishing for tuna. 
um, you can know about that. And you can also have some indication of like the health of your fish stocks and things like that. Um, one of the challenges that they have is that, you know, in deploying a full system like that, it records terabytes of data on a single trip. So you need multiple hard drives, you need a whole system you have to build out. Um, it's another example where, you know, the trends in computer vision could, could benefit. Um, if you could get it low cost enough, you could imagine deploying it in, in a wider area. Like I was just listening to the BBC News last week and uh, they were talking about how fishing vessels from the EU will sail down the coast of Africa um, and fly what's called a flag of convenience. So where they'll pretend to be a Senegalese fishing boat and they'll you know catch all their fish there and then sail back to the EU. Uh, because Senegal, Senegal doesn't have great enforcement and it's kind of easy to get a license there. Uh, the problem with that is that, you know, the fishing stocks there aren't being sustainably managed. So you can imagine a solution where if you can get it low cost enough, you deploy a camera system that, you know, is battery powered, bolts onto a fishing boat um, and maybe communicates, has GPS and communicates to a low power, uh, low bandwidth satellite network like Lacuna. Lacuna is trying to do LoRaWAN from space. So you can imagine sending small amounts of text like those MQTT messages we were talking about before where they might just say, hey, we've seen this many fish and this is our GPS location. Um, you know, suddenly you have a way to, you know, manage uh, th these kinds of uh, problems um, um, at scale. Whereas, you know, it might not be possible to put like a full video recording system and, and have all of the manual labor associated with looking through that video, um, you know, in that, in that situation. Okay, so we actually have a, a lot of engineers and architects here on uh, our audience who would be wondering what that uh, workflow looks like of developing an industrial IoT solution like from scratch up to a fully fledged application. Would you mind walking us through what that would look like? Yeah, and I'll talk a bit about, um, you know, what that looks like for a, a vision based system, though, I mean, we could talk about other things as well. It'll vary um, from solution to solution. And we do some work in deep tech, which is kind of its own thing a little bit. Um, but yeah, the so so you know at Misty West we do product development. We offer services in that area. So if you need engineering help taking an idea from you know napkin sketch to you know tens or hundreds of thousands of units, that's something we regularly work on. Um, so so hit us up. But here's the here's the workflow we typically use. Um, I think the first thing to do really um, with all these ideas um, is to do some of your market research um, and make sure that you have some degree of product market fit. Um, sometimes you can do that by looking at competitors and understanding what your performance is going to be relative to them. Um, so I gave examples of competitors in both of the previous applications. So doing a competitive benchmark and looking at what's out there and what you think your performance is going to be relative to those is really helpful. If you're launching a new solution where there's no competitor, you could be in a situation where you need to build your own market, which can be really challenging. Um, so that would be something that requires extra due diligence. And then, you know, ultimately at the end of the day, it can be very easy to talk to people and get them to say, hey, yes, we need this problem solved. Um, it's easy to just say yes. Um, I think the reality is you don't know for sure if you've got something on your hands that is worth pursuing until you actually do a transaction with people, until you get them to buy that thing. So, you know, one of the first things we'll do after, and often the clients will come having done their own market research, like that's not really something that, that we'll do, but we'll make sure that they've, that is done and is in place and that we're actually appropriate to help them. Um, and then we'll help basically go from that market research, those user studies, user interviews, um, we'll, we'll help them on the industrial design side and turning that into a set of like high level requirements. And then we'll look at those high level requirements and say, you know, are any of these really challenging to me? So like, say you wanna do um, battery power computer vision on, on a fishing boat. Um, well, what does that mean in terms of your power budget? Like how much, how big does the battery actually have to be? How, how, how is this camera on 24 seven? How much power does it consume? You know, what is the inferencing at the edge consume? And you might come to the decision that, hey, you know, you need a massive battery to do this. Um, so you may say, okay, well, we need a way to basically not have this thing on all the time. So you might look at like a proximity IR sensor or some other way to indicate like when things are going on. Um, and then, you know, you might say, well, this, we're not sure how well this is going to work. 
So that would be something that would be suitable for like a subsystem test. And we might just quickly pull something off of like Adafruit or whatever, and just throw it into a similar situation and quickly test it to verify assumptions. Once we have, you know, those high level assumptions verified, or maybe we've gone through it and we're like, we don't need to subsystem test any of this, then we'll work towards like a P1 or an MVP. So first prototype. Um, and we'll rapidly iterate towards basically something that demonstrates the core functionality. It might not be the exact form factor. It's not going to have considerations for design for manufacturing. Um, and we'll try to quickly get that done. And then the, the thing to do with that is to give that to your alpha customers, see if they'll pay you for it, see what kind of benefit they get out of it and learn. Um, after that, we'll, if that all goes well, well, we'll basically help with the transition to manufacturing. So we'll start doing DFM at that point and get to a, a P2 or an engineering validation prototype where it's manufactured maybe on soft tools or things like that. So if you want to, so say that camera system I was talking about before, you know, the, the P1 will have, you know, it'll have the satellite radio that we've selected. Um, it will have the, the right camera sensor, the right optics. Um, you know, if the SOM that we've designed makes sense, it'll use that SOM, maybe it uses something else, whatever makes the most sense for the application. Um, and then, you know, the P1 might be um, inside a prefab box or something like that. Um, or it might be, you know, 3D printed enclosure that has the right shape. The P2 will be maybe designed on like a soft tool or something like that, and maybe it'll, uh, or we might just go straight to hard tooling, depending on how we feel about it. But, um, you know, and then you'll have like injection molded plastics and things like that. Um, and you might make 50 to 100 to a couple hundred of those. Um, and not only will you be getting some more prototypes to test, but you'll be validating your engineering design, finding out if there are issues with, say, how the electronics are designed or, you know, how the mechanicals are designed. You might be finding out more firmware, software bugs. Um, you know, maybe you have some edge cases you didn't handle there. Um, and from that, um, you'll basically provide feedback to your um, contract manufacturer. You might implement some controls, say, hey, you know, uh, this part of the optics always has issues. We forgot to add Loctite to the lens. So the um, working distance of the camera has shifted slightly when the lens is loosened off or, or whatever. So we need to make sure to check the Loctite is there before we button this thing up, whatever it is. Um, and the other thing um, you'll want to think about as well, and this part is often underestimated with IoT, is kind of the software infrastructure to support it. So some of those frameworks I mentioned earlier, um, there's like AWS or Zero IoT, you know, are you talking to them? How are you going to manage your fleet of devices at scale? How are you going to roll out a firmware update, um, you know, to a thousand of these devices on fishing boats? If you want to say, add a new type of fish, you want to be able to classify or something. Um, so that can be quite challenging on its own. There are partners we work with um, for that kind of stuff. Edge Impulse is one of them. Um, there's, there's, you know, there's a lot of different ways you can slice that problem. There's also problems around, um, you know, how do you get, so say you see some novel event on a boat. So say a new type of fish is, maybe they captured, maybe they, they've hauled in a shark as bycatch or something like that. You know, what do you do with that event and that data? How do you, how do you learn from that lesson? How do you make sure other sensors can benefit from that event? Um, so there's things you can do where um, you might run like a hashing algorithm on your training data um, and, and, or on like a, you know, a series of images. Um, and then you can put that hash on device and you can measure something called hamming distance. So you can say, is the image I'm seeing right now similar to or really different from all of these other images I've used to train the algorithm? And if it's really different based on really a, this hashing comparison, you can say, hey, this is a novel image. Um, I should save this on device for later when I can upload it. And then you can have a way to basically transfer learnings from your field deployment that doesn't involve streaming all of the video to the cloud all the time and then processing all of it. Um, so there, there are clever things you can do like that at scale. Um, so that's kind of the whole picture. There's a lot to say here, obviously, yeah. when we're really just scratching the surface, but hopefully that's helpful. Oh yeah, it certainly is. Or maybe if we could just maybe uh, go a, a, a bit further into it, uh, as far as the image processing uh, is concerned. So there's like um, 
two approaches to it, like the AI best image processing and like the rules best. Maybe could you like briefly give us a description of what AI best and rules best is uh, for those who might not be familiar with those two terms and then maybe compare when, uh, under what circumstances would you want to use rules best or what benefits does it have over AI and vice versa? Yeah, great question. Um, I think AI based um, image processing is maybe more the rage right now. And the MPU I'm describing for say our SOM is targeted at that specifically. So um, AI based um, image processing would be like running a convolutional neural network um, to classify objects in an image. So you might've heard of uh, YOLO or you only look once. Um, it's a type of convolutional neural network algorithm. It's called you only look once because it tries to um, basically look at one image and classify objects from that. Um, so the MPU we have on our SOM basically takes uh, an ONNX format from TensorFlow um, and that ONNX format is generated from one of these algorithms. So it's basically a series of linear algebra operations that are trained based on training data to create this convolutional neural network. So um, it's hard to describe with words, but if you look up convolutional neural network on Google, you'll probably see an image um, where uh, basically there's a series of nodes and lines connecting them. Um, and then those lines are, are weighted um, between nodes and there's basically a whole bunch of linear algebra that happens from, from start to finish. And the reality is like, um, you know, humans don't, like you, a human isn't aware of all those connections and all those weightings. They're aware of like the high level architecture of that convolutional neural network, um, but they're not aware of all the details. Um, so for, uh, you know, rules-based image processing, it's a little different. Um, where again, in this case, it's more like applying a formula, like a well-understood formula and mapping that over the entire image. Um, so you might apply, the, and, and, and typically how this is done is with a library called Open Computer Vision or OpenCV. Um, and you can do a lot of powerful things with OpenCV. Um, and um, so like uh, examples of this would be like transferring an image or, or converting an image from say, RGB space to hue saturation, I think value, HSV space. Um, so you, there's advantages to doing that. When you're in HSV space, it can be easier to say, um, filter out certain colors from an image um, and things like that. Um, so you might tr go from RGB to HSV space and then try to filter the image for things that look like they're neon orange. And then suddenly all the cones in your image um, can pop out a bit more. And then you might do things like use other algorithms, um, like maybe you wanna calculate the centroid of all of those orange blobs. So there's some more math you'll do there where you'll look at all the orange cones and get points that are roughly in the middle of each of those blobs of orange. And um, there are standard libraries in OpenCV that'll do things like that. And then you might try to fit a line to those centroids. And then you have, you'll know like, okay, this is where, you know, this is the line these clones have been placed in. And from that you can infer and do other things. So um, in some ways, this kind of um, rules-based approach is powerful in that um, you don't need a large set of training data to use it. You can use your intelligence as a human to program that into a computer. The problem is that it's less flexible, you know, like you can imagine like trying to program that way to recognize, you know, a cat from a dog um, would maybe be almost impossible, I would say. Yeah. Um, whereas for a convolutional neural network, like if you have the training data, if you have enough of it, um, you can train these things, um, you know, in an AWS SageMaker instance fairly quickly and have it distinguish between those two instances. So they're, they're, they're kind of appropriate in different areas um, would be the way to, way to say it, but hopefully that's a high level explanation of kind of what they are and, and how they're different. Um, you mentioned OpenCV, uh, like uh, yeah. As far as the Milky Way is concerned, would you have like maybe something to talk about? Is how to select what? How, what's the best approach in selecting a, a Milky Way? TensorFlow, OpenCV, TensorFlow Lite. Um, I I can't say too too much about it. I think the the answer is that um, it will. Uh, I mean, it's gonna, it's not like an apples to apples com 
Paris and or, or um, so like you know a rules based processing algorithm like the reality is often you'll use both. Okay. Um, uh, you'll use OpenCV, and then you you might put information into your comp into into training um, your okay. your CNN. So, like one thing that I, I mean, I can talk more about this, but like one thing um, that will happen is extending data sets. So you'll take a training data set of a thousand images, and then you will extend that to say a hundred thousand images by rotating all of them, by changing the the color balance on them, by um, basically doing all kinds of things um, to, to account for new edge cases that you might be worried about. And that'll be your training data set basically. Um, but that's all done with these rules based. So like you'll, and then even when it's operating in the wild, like there might be some things that you try to do in terms of pre-processing before you put it into a convolutional neural network. So like um, HDR would be like one of those things. Um, and then like is HDR middleware? It's not really middleware. <laughs> like I think middleware is also maybe not the right word. Um, Cause in terms of where these things happen, like um, it, you know, this can be happening in the cloud, right? Yeah. Um, which is that a middleware, but um, HDR is often happening on an FPGA or an image processing unit that's like attached to a camera module. Like it might not even be happening in your SOC. Um, Okay, so um, as you mentioned, uh, in, in some of the uh, embedded vision applications, you'd have a, a situation whereby you are transmitting information to, to a backend, like uh, you gave an example of uh, uh, Bosch and, and many other applications where you are transmitting information to some, uh, some form of backend application. What, what sort of uh, wireless connectivity uh, would you need to, 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 to put in place for you to be able to, to achieve that? Like, what are the options there for wireless connectivity? Yeah, uh, and obviously it's gonna be really site specific and application specific. Um, I think the most common one, right? Certainly in like say the smart home is Wi-Fi. Um, and that can work well when it's implemented well. Um, one of the challenges there is like, how do you provision your Wi-Fi connection? Um, if you look at like, uh, um, Waze, I don't know if you're familiar with Waze. I think they're Seattle based or Wise, Wise. It's not Waze, Waze is the um, app for driving. Um, you know, they have like a very clean QR code based setup where um, I think they encode your Wi Fi credentials into a QR code and you just hold it in front of the camera. Um, and then, you know, uh, you can also have um, like a multi stage wireless connection where you might use like Wi Fi or LoRaWAN locally. Now, LoRaWAN isn't going to be appropriate for a video uh, communication solution and probably only very low resolution images. Um, but if you're operating intelligence at the edge, then, you know, you can, as I was mentioning earlier, you can go with like text based outputs. Um, and then maybe that gets backhauled by cellular potentially. Um, or satellite. So like some of the applications we've worked on for say mine sites and things like that, you know, you need to use satellite backhaul. Um, um, and then there are devices that communicate directly over cellular. Um, one of the challenges we've seen with that is, you know, if you just say work with AWS IoT, um, I think they have a tendency to format everything into JSON. So you might actually be sending like a low resolution um, image and one one application I can think of um, there was a company doing this where they had um, they wanted to basically put cameras in um, garbage bins behind restaurants and facilities and when that bin got full the camera would say hey this thing this bin is looking full like let's call the call the truck basically so that you wouldn't have the truck coming like two three times a week when it wasn't needed um, <clears throat> so there's a bunch of savings there but one of the problems they had is you know they implemented cellular IoT because there's no Wi-Fi say in this bin. Um, so they might be using like MBIOT or CATM1 or something like that. Um, but then they're sending um, these images as JSON files and like the headers for that image for the JSON file are almost as large as the image or larger than the image. So, you know, that's another thing you have to be mindful of when you're developing vision applications. It's like, how are you encoding the video? How are you encoding the images? How are you sending them? Um, I think in that case, they ended up switching to something with better compression or like something um, uh, maybe like their own binary thing. Um, and it ended up saving them like, I don't know, 
60% of their data consumption on that cellular provider, which, you know, when you have thousands of devices deployed at scale, like, you know, that's a significant amount of money. Um, yeah. yeah, so those are some challenges we've seen. Um, I think that's most of it. All right, so uh, that brings us to the end of this uh, conversation. Uh, Taylor, thank you so much. It's been an absolute pleasure having you on the show today. Yeah, thank you very much for having me, Kudzai. It's been great to be here. Um, you have a lot of really interesting uh, content. Thank you. Um, congratulations on your new position at HiveMQ as well. Oh, thanks. Thank you.